indeed, and thank you everyone for being here. Good morning. Last session presentation of the day. Hang in there. So, uh, yes, my name is Olga. I'm also a final year PhD student uh, here at, uh, at BI, marketing department. And yes, I am going to talk about marketing communications for new product launches. Or is this really good idea, right, to create all this buzz when you're launching a new product? So, in many industries, many firms spend a lot of their budgets and marketing efforts into promoting an upcoming product that they will launch, so on pre-launch marketing. From teasing the product on social media, issuing press releases, creating all sorts of promotional content and advertising way before the product is available on the market. And all of that to get people talking, right? Of course, companies like Apple, this is uh, from, uh, from last year's uh, um, big launch event, they take it to a whole new level, right? They just had a, a launch event uh, this week, uh, if you follow uh, their products. So they have taken it to a whole new level. And of course, they demonstrate the products, they really showcase how to use it, educate, uh, provide all sorts of details. And of course, the result is, People talk about it, they search online, <coughs> news articles appear, and publications talk about it as well. So that's great, that's fantastic in fact, right? The thing is, not, not every brand is Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, and still, if we look at the whole picture, a lot of new consumer products fail after launch. And so it, it's critical for marketers, managers to understand the effectiveness of their marketing communications, to be able to use them as best as possible to support such new product launches. And when we talk about marketing communications, um, I'm gonna talk about a useful classification here that we're gonna, just to set up the stage. And of course, uh, researchers love classifications of all, all sorts. So one, one type of communications are the owned communications. Those are generated by the firm in its own channels. So, on website, you might put up a press release on your social media accounts, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or whatever they are using. Um, that is the own communication of the company. So you'll tweet out, hey, look forward to my product um, coming up this fall. You know, it's going to be great. But most commonly, actually, you might think of advertising. So paid communications by the firm, whether we're talking about traditional advertising or more of the common online advertising on Google, on uh, social media <laughs> platforms like Facebook, these are uh, very widely used. But if the communications are not owned or paid for by the company, then we call them earned. So that is the classification here, the communications that are earned by the company from consumers chattering online and leaving product reviews or from news outlets and publications that um, review your product or just report on the latest news that you uh, put out, how the product is going to be like and all of that counts as earned media. And the conventional wisdom, as mentioned at the beginning, is that Companies will use their toolbox of communications to try to generate as much earned media and hype and buzz before the product is even on the market, right? So what's wrong with that? Well, nothing, well, I mean, some things. Well, there's clearly benefits, right? But as it turns out, there are some risks or potential downsides that you should be mindful of. Research points us to certain things. So first of all, really obvious. Talking about your product, promoting it, creates awareness. You create interest in the product, it creates demand for the product. Even before it's launched, people think, oh, I'm going to buy that. And that should translate to sales. So pre-launch buzz has been clearly linked to new product sales. On the other hand, when you're making people aware that you're coming up with a new product in the next few months, that may make them stop their planned purchases from your other products. So you're not the one product company that's just being launched. You have a portfolio of products, complementary products, substitutes, partially, uh, especially when you're talking about these like smartphones, they come up with products every year, right? So you need to be mindful of cannibalization of your other product sales, not just look at one product uh, by itself. And part of my research deals with this. 
aspect with uh, estimating cannibalization effects. Next, pre-launch marketing communications are used strategically by the firm. And they use these advertising and communications to, um, to signal that they have confidence in the product quality and that they support the product launch. And this is, of course, very beneficial. It creates expectations about the future for performance. So I was like, okay, that's confident. You have invested money behind this product. It means it's going to be good. On the other hand, research also shows that if you advertise more than average in your industry, for instance, it might, about your upcoming product, it might create too high expectations. So there's a problem of, well, if you meet those expectations, great, you met my expectations. Well, what more do you want? So if you look at it from an investor's point of view or a shareholder's point of view, um, they would be fine, happy. Right? But if you flop on the product, if you don't deliver on all of the claims that you make and all the hype uh, before the launch, that's not going to uh, bode well. And finally, here, marketing communications in the pre-launch are extremely important for providing information to consumers to reduce their uncertainty about potentially buying your product, especially relevant in more innovative products, product launches, but in general, People may be uncertain about, ah, oh, I don't know if this is going to really pan out, if this is going to be as good as they say. Um, maybe I don't really understand how, to, how it benefits me. So talking about your product pre-launch and explaining to consumers and to the market how to prepare for it, what's great about it, and so on, helps reduce uncertainty. But on the other hand, it also allows competitors access to that kind of information, which if you're planning a, a launch in, a, in the next, let's say, few months, maybe that's not enough time, but in many cases, you might announce a new product more than six months in advance. That's plenty of time for your competitor to speed up their process of developing a similar product that maybe they're already working on. They might hit the market sooner than you, or they might adjust their product to make it better than what you're talking and promoting. Right? So clearly research has already shown some of these things and that there's not just benefits of creating pre-launch buzz and marketing your product pre-launch, but there's also some risks and you need to consider different audiences and different objectives uh, with, of these pre-launch communications. On top of that, I mentioned there's different kinds of marketing communications, right? And you might use different tools. So, these may vary in their effectiveness in achieving these objectives. Pre-launch versus post-launch. When you're supporting a new product launch, you might promote just both pre and post. After the product is available on the market, you will continue promoting it perhaps, right? So this is another part of my, what my research uh, is focusing on and what I'm going to talk about next. So owned and paid media communications, how do these uh, effects on firm performance differ? Pre-launch versus post-launch. So this is a very relevant question in such industries like consumer electronics. We've uh, showed uh, the example of, of uh, smartphones, but this extends to most products where you can really, uh, you have doubts about product quality before you try the product. So you need to really try the product, to experience it in order to, to be able to evaluate if the product is really good or not. So in this case, you, we tend to be very influenced by marketing communications, <laughs> what other people say, uh, and it is very important to try to understand how to best use our tools. And when we talk about firm performance, uh, um, uh, uh, general measures of firm performance, uh, what we look at in, in this uh, work is firm value. So that is firm performance on the stock market. And we decompose this into two parts. We first think about returns, so that is the profits, the profit part, the revenue part uh, of, the, of, the, of the company, and then risk, so that is the uncertainty about those profits or about the revenue. How certain uh, is the, um, the market, the investors, uh, that you will make those profits? That is two, two aspects. And we take our question and we um, try to answer this with some data from um, video games industry. It's a huge billion dollar industry, but it's uh, frequent product introductions and uh, abundant online communications and marketing. So 
Buzz is kind of the name of the game there. We, uh, we take one particular uh, company which launched uh, five new products with, uh, uh, between 2017 and 2018 and 13 other uh, smaller but uh, product improvements to those. And we gather online communications data, both from the company and from consumers. So we get all of that as well as the financial performance of that firm value that I talked about. And here comes the fun part. So we look at what the company does on social media. What are the tools that they use? So one thing that they use is paid social media. They use these kind of sponsored tweets or sponsored posts that you might have seen yourself on social media, on Instagram a lot, but also on Twitter. <clears throat> so they have the hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored, hashtag partner, uh, what, what have you. And they use these consumers who are more experienced in the products and have a certain reputation perhaps in the industry, and they tr get them to promote their products. So they benefit from the paid aspect. It's very clearly disclosed. They have to do that. But it's also, it's not the, the advertising agency. It's a consumer that still talks about these things. That's very interesting. And also the firm, of course, communicates with its own channels, both more traditional press releases, so talking to, to uh, the uh, general um, uh, news uh, uh, outlets, and also its social media. So we take out their tweets, uh, in this case, uh, to, to have a comparison with the paid social media. And of course, because we need to account for the effects of this consumer side and the news. So the earned media, what are the effects on that? We account for all of this into a complex system. We try to disentangle uh, the effects and here's what we find. First, the owned communications. Turns out they are very effective. They're very effective in general in, in having a positive effect on uh, firm performance on the stock market, but also particularly effective in the pre-launch period. So they are, well, it's, it's a great investment there in the pre-launch to um, yeah, make sure that investors understand you will have a higher performance and they will be more certain of that performance on the stock market. The surprise perhaps is that these sponsored tweets that the company uses are not particularly effective in the pre-launch period, neither for returns or for risk. They have a positive effect on returns, so investors tend to appreciate companies who use these uh, sponsored uh, paid social media and say, well, that's a, they're investing money, they're using <laughs> these uh, credible, experienced uh, consumers, but it does, doesn't particularly reward firms that do so to promote new products. So that doesn't seem to be a worthwhile investment there. And of course, because we're dealing with social media, we don't just look at just the amount of tweets uh, there, but we also look at the amount of engagement that the content, uh, those tweets generate, or so the, the likes and the retweets of some sort. What we find is that paid media, again, doesn't seem to do anything overall for firm value, for firm performance on the stock market. And I say that because, of course, there's a caveat we have a complex system here. It turns out this is useful, but not for the firm value. It's useful in generating buzz. And one other piece of uh, information that we, we, we got here is that the engagement with your own tweets seems to be the most relevant uh, in, in pre-launch. So it doesn't help you very much as a firm to just have a lot of engagement with your tweets overall, but it sends a really good signal if you're promoting a new product and you're, you're garnering a lot of engagement with your own tweets. So investors appreciate that uh, a lot. But what about this buzz, right? This chatter online? What are the effects of that? Well, it doesn't affect returns, but it reduces risk. So it makes your investors more certain of your performance. Having uh, people talk about your products before they're launching, that is a, a sign that they are more certain that you will do well. But it doesn't increase their appreciation of how much you're gonna do well, of your profits and revenues. So having that uh, said, I will 
just try to wrap it up with all the other pieces of information. Clearly, there's some benefits and risks to using a pre-launch marketing communications too much, or what is too much, right? There's different sides, different audiences to consider, and uh, also different products. So on one hand, creating all this buzz around an upcoming product launch helps the firm, certainly, by reducing this uncertainty that the market has. Not just the investors, but consumers may feel more uh, relaxed that, yes, this is going to be a good product. People are talking about it. Okay, I'm going to be more likely to buy it. But it can also really hurt the firm. So you need to take into account the potential for cannibalizing your sales from other products. Don't just have one analysis on one product, but look at the whole picture. And another uh, takeaway relates to the different marketing communications that one may use. So they have varying roles and effects pre-launch versus post-launch. It's important to know where to focus them. And it seems that it is quite useful to focus them pre-launch. So owned social media tweets and uh, press releases, put them in the pre-launch. Of course, you already do that, but it's the, the higher volume increases the performance, has a more positive effect, uh, while paid social media doesn't seem to, predict, to have the same effect in the pre-launch. So those would be the, I'd say, the key takeaways from, from today. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to discuss. Uh, thank you.